Okay, so today we will um, finish up chapter th chapter three and start with chapter four. We're going to be uh, discussing discussing certain important concepts again. Uh, we already talked about speech communities and communities of practice. We did not really talk about uh, social networks. These are different ways that sociolinguists have tried to approach the, the idea of, because when we're, when we're talking about sociolinguistics, we're talking about language and society, we're talking about language and groups of language users very often, and how these various users of language, uh, how they how they change, how they, how they differ from, from uh, one another. And there are some demographic uh, ideas of how uh, people can differ from, from uh, one another, but that's not the only thing, of course, because we are entering uh, into our discussion, we did enter into our discussion, uh, the, the notion of uh, registers, which means that every single speech situation demands a little bit of a different register, a little bit of a different different language. And, um, and uh, then uh, these notions have been proposed in order to kind of understand um, how people interact with each other, in what kinds of constellations of other people. So speech communities is a very abstract notion. We can say that all English speakers are form a speech community within the United States. We could say all Spanish speakers form a uh, speech community. All immigrant Finnish speakers form a speech community. But of course, it's it's already uh, clear that this is this is very vague, and uh, nobody can be defined uh, just by you know based on one speech community that they belong to because it's it's dependent on the the situation, and um, that's why the notion of communities of practice was introduced because people get together with one another in order to get something done. Like people go to church for a particular reason, and that is a community of practice. We come here to Evans 105 for a particular reason, so we form a community of practice in that sense, because we come here to learn about sociolinguistics, and, uh, and that makes us a, uh, a a community of practice because practice community of practice always has kind of like a goal. What are we going to while getting together? Why are we talking to each other? Because we are a community of practice in order to get some some uh, job done, and that job may be may be very abstract. We just you know get together, like for instance, people after uh, in the in the times when people could get uh, get together after Friday, uh, Friday's work day is over, they got together, they went to have uh, perhaps a drink or get, uh, get a meal together after work. Of course, they form a community of practice at work. Then uh, that community of practice can also form like a subgroup who always on Fridays go, go out together. And, uh, and what is the purpose of that? Um, to bond, in a sense, to celebrate the beginning of the weekend or whatever. So we have, we have these different overlapping communities of practice. And always, you know, depending on why are we getting together, that kind of defines what a community of practice is. Then social networks uh, approach is quite interesting also because that provides another very concrete way of uh, understanding uh, what we do, how, how we, when we are a, a speech community, when we are a community of practice, what our relationships to each other or one another are. So uh, if we have a uh, social network, um, people, people are uh, 
depicted in how they interact, who they interact with. And uh, then the connections of interaction may be weaker or stronger, uh, so the social networks can be dense, more dense, or more, um, more loose, so denser or looser. So if we kind of like depict ourselves here, so that would be me. Um, and uh, in this particular social network of the four of us. So I'm there, uh, I'm interacting with Selina and Ayana and Nani. Ashley Nani. Sorry. and I should also say it again. our little network here, plus everybody who is behind the video. Uh, so, uh, so if we just think about this, um, is this a dense or a loose network? And how would we define this as a dense or a loose network? Um, we need to ask this. Um, Outside Evans 105, do you ever get together? No? Yes. So you don't really know. This is the first class you're taking together, right? Maybe. Or you haven't been, you know, uh, getting to know each other really well. And that's, that's quite usual. Uh, we come to class because that's the, that's the community of practice. And um, when we get together, that doesn't really say how much we actually interact with each other or one another. And uh, in this case, I seem to be the only common denominator in this particular social network. Now, if we have a situation where, uh, where, we, where two of you for instance, are not only taking this class together, but Madison and Selina are roommates also together. Uh, then there would be a connection here. Or Ayana and Selina um, have a job after class, and that is the same job. So you would be interacting there as well. Okay. Uh, if all of you uh, decide to sometimes get together to study in the library, if that were possible, then you would be having another uh, connection there. So the three of you would be, um, would be interacting. But also in this particular situation, that would make this particular social network uh, uh, denser, more dense. Does that make sense? So, uh, in our, our society, um, social networks tend to be loose, that we come together for a particular reason, and we don't socialize beyond that particular reason. In uh, rural and older societies, people tended to have connections with each other in multiple different ways. So that if somebody was your teacher, that person was also your neighbor and could be married to your uncle, uh, so would also be your aunt, and uh, could have occasionally been your babysitter when you were small, so there would be a fourth uh, different uh, connection there. So in, it, you can see how like you know in, in different kinds of neighborhoods the networks can be stronger or looser. So looser, more loose, that doesn't sound, that sounds better. So, so uh, for instance if you live in some kind of a suburb 
and if there is no like homeowners association where people get together on a regular basis, then people tend to just you know go to their homes and not socialize with their neighbors, and the family uh, network is then very uh, dense. But outside the family, then people know people at the work, but they don't socialize after after work very often. So it doesn't make that work uh, network any any more dense. Does that make sense? So um, in traditional societies. Uh, there were small societies, people didn't interact with a lot of people, uh, other people, and they tended to have multiple relationships with the same people. So, you know, you're a neighbor, you're a relative, you are a friend, um, you go to the same job, and so on and so forth. So, it's, it's gotten quite different. Um, getting to know one's neighbors, for instance, in order to make a social network of the neighborhood um, is, is not really easy nowadays. People tend to think, you know, if you talk to your neighbors, it's like, um, we want to be left alone. Depends on people, of course. But, um, I, I mean, I have lived in, in the same house for over 15 years, and, and I know a couple of the neighbors uh, but we don't like get together or do things together. Whereas in the small village that I grew up in, everybody knew each other. Everybody uh, got together for certain certain uh, functions. There were organized functions in order to strengthen the village network. So things have changed. They changed. Societies changed. And, uh, and, and it's just kind of like a, you know, a reflection of loose versus um, uh, dense networks. Uh, what we call this kind of a situation where you'd be getting together or you'd be roommates or you'd be taking several, up, several other classes together, that would form a, what is called a multiplex network where people have multiple relations with each other. But, if, but in, in here, you know, what we tend to do is, you know, you take one class and those are the people you see there and then you see a totally different network in another class. Anyway, so uh, this whole thing brings us to identities uh, because, uh, because um, so uh, all of these things kind of contribute to identities. Uh, what is your larger speech community? We are Americans, we are all English speakers, and uh, then there are these other networks of uh, communities of practice that are defined by the purposes of uh, people getting together. And then social networks, and we all have multiple social networks, right? And, uh, and uh, these all reflect our identities. But you know, when, when we talk about a person's uh, linguistic identity, or identity in general, which is reflected in the language that we use, the kind of language that, that we use, or, or the kinds of languages that we use, or kinds of styles or registers that we use. Uh, those are reflections of those identities, multiple identities, because nobody has just one identity. And the identities are somehow defined by what kinds of social networks you belong to, what kinds of communities of practice, of course, these are overlapping. These, all these concepts are overlapping. Uh, what kinds of communities of practice you participate in, and what the overall speech community is that you kind of uh, belong to. So, um, so um, if you start thinking about your identities, um, could you mention some of the identities beyond that? You know, your students and you are. Americans, your English speakers, what other identities might you have? Yeah. 
if you care to share. Well, I have once a strong identity which uh, I kind of cultivate and that's being not only a, a dual citizen of, uh, of the United States and Finland, but that, that in itself gives me two identities. So I concretely, I have two passports, I have two identities. Um, and then, uh, then one of my strong identities of being an American Finn, a Finnish person, of, a person of Finnish descent who lives in America. And there are a lot of different on, online groups, of course, it's by definition, it is a loose network because uh, beyond my family, I don't know a lot of American Finns who, I know there's one other Finn who lives in Huntsville, but, uh, but, uh, but that's not, that it wouldn't be practical or it's impossible to have a dense network of, uh, of Finnish Americans. But I belong to multiple, like for instance, Facebook groups. There are Finnish American women. There are, um, it, it's called something like wonderful women in America. <laughs> wonderful Finnish, or Finnish women in America. I forget what the, the title is. There is a religious group that is only Finns who live uh, abroad, not in Finland, expatriate Finns um, of women only. <laughs> and uh, there is like a marketplace for Finnish Americans. There is a book exchange network for Finnish Americans and so on and so forth. Uh, all kinds of discussion groups. So it's kind of amazing. So this, uh, this means that there are multiple networks that are available for someone with that kind of a narrow identity. But then we, even within that narrow identity, your identity can be even more narrow. So there are like, you know, both groups for all American things, then only for women, then only for uh, religiously affiliated women, then the book uh, club, and, and, and so on. So it's, it's, quite, uh, it's, it's quite fascinating. So can you, can you think of other identities that, you know, from your point of view? The networks that kind of define your multiple identities, the networks you belong to. Yes. Uh, well, I don't know if this counts as my identity, but I went to Magnolia High School. Yes. And that's part of my education, I guess. Um, and uh, I have a friend group up in, here in Huntsville where everyone goes to Sam, but they also went to Magnolia. So it's kind of like overlapping where we were friends there. We're friends here, we take classes together, we like go to clubs together, so. Yes, yes. So, uh, and that's, that's very, very typical that uh, what schools you went to, you belong to that network in a way. And today, because we have we have social networks, social networking, that kind of makes it very concrete of what our networks are. So I get graduate, having graduated from University of Southern California, I very loosely belong to that network. I get their their emails every now and then, and and so on. The Trojan mail. But um, of course, for all of us, we have the identity of our family. And that's another. Now, with the, with the pandemic, um, my, my daughters and I have formed a WhatsApp group, which is a very dense uh, identity. It's so we, we do mentoring of each other. We talk about, you know, do trouble talk. We uh, post uh, photos that we think others will find interesting and, and supportive and entertaining and uh, so on and so forth. Then we have another WhatsApp, WhatsApp group uh, into which we have invited my son. So, so within the same family, we have you know, two networks. 
and then we expand that sometimes and include uh, include my step children and then for Christmas for instance we included uh, we included uh, the stepchildren and their spouses and their uh, all the grandparents uh, which with multiple divorces makes <laughs> makes a very large group but uh, but we did that for Christmas and uh, and try to get together at least so uh, so so it kind of made me think that wow even within fun, one family we can define these networks in in different ways and some are more dense some are looser more loose <laughs> so anyway and and the, and the social media kind of makes it very tangible that hey this must be my network because i belong to this group but uh, but how what does this have to do with language then it has to do with language through identity because the networks are identity builders the communities of practice are identity builders and um, and uh, Obviously, speech communities are identity builders. So we define ourselves, our identities, our multiple identities, based on these kinds of things, and then um, th then that that defines how we speak in different situations, right? So. Uh, you are more likely to tell jokes in, within certain kinds of networks than than others. Certain kinds of jokes within within this this particular network than within another. Uh, you may be very careful about uh, making any kinds of jokes in certain networks, and uh, and that is just one one silly example. Um, but. Uh, but how informally we speak, how formally we speak, obviously you're getting a university education means that you can draw on this network that you are going to be, you know, part of uh, our university's alumni and uh, you will be alumni uh, of this university because you're all girls. So. Uh, so uh, that is an interesting thing, which uh, is kind of like forces and identity. So alumna is Latin for female, and alumnus is Latin for male. And then we have this problem when we obviously want to refer to people without making a point that they are either men or women. So the Latin of alumnus, the plural would be alumni and here it would be alumni. So uh, so we have this problem. What do you call what do you, by the way, what what's the word that this is kind of a digression. But what is the word you use we use uh, to refer to people who have graduated from our university? Alumni. alumni. Right? Yes. Yes. And that is in a way it's uh, if we uh, strict about it. It's kind of sexist because it refers in Latin. It refers only to men. Uh, but people have then tried to fix this, uh, like we talked about. Use language to fix social things. Uh, avoid being sexist. So we're just talking about alums, <laughs> and that has so that has uh, led to kind of a kind of a change, but you see all kinds of things, and obviously a lot of people don't know the, you know, the Latin uh, inflections or, or the plurals, Latin plurals for for the words uh, nowadays. Uh, very few people study Latin, but anyway, so um, so you will be a, a member of that very large network of people who have graduated from here. And that will somehow define your identity in all the other networks that you interact with. Do you want to draw from, from uh, that identity in all situations? Maybe not, but, uh, but when you, for instance, go for a job interview and you have to show that you have a university degree, you will be probably using a little bit more formal language because you have that degree. 
Does that make sense? Yes. All right. So, uh, of course, let's now talk about attitudes. Because the fact that people belong to different networks and speak uh, by networks and communities of practice and speech communities, it means that people speak differently. And last time we talked about like dialects, which are defined by groups of language users, and, uh, and they vary from group to group, a little bit on an average. But, um, but uh, these identities are reflected in language, and then people's attitudes are going to be, people have a lot of attitudes about language. And uh, the attitudes uh, tend to be lay attitudes. They tend to be, they tend to be sometimes misinformed, uh, linguistically misinformed, based on stereotypes. So people have a lot of stereotypes about what certain uh, members of certain networks, um, you know, are going to be sounding like. Does that make sense? So a lot of uh, a lot of the attitudes uh, that we hear are um, are kind of interesting, and of course linguists uh, try to work actively in order to in order to correct attitudes that uh, that are not uh, based on on um, linguistic. Of facts, uh, because a linguistic fact is that everybody's variety is equal, <laughs> is created equal. Uh, then, yet we live in a world where one variety has been lifted above all, all others, and that's the standard English, uh, which has overt prestige. However, there are speech communities that have a lot of prestige within the speech community. Very often, like, you know, what, the, what your book is telling us, people, people don't appreciate their own uh, varieties and, uh, and their own attitudes. They, they find them uh, positive, but their language variety positive, but not necessarily prestigious. And yet there are uh, speech communities uh, of speakers of non-standard varieties, which within the group, within the network, uh, appreciate a lot uh, of that particular variety. So um, we will we'll be introducing these two terms, over prestige, is attached to Standard English, for instance. Here, standard American English. In this country, it has over prestige. Prestige that you know everybody acknowledges that, OK, that's the prestige variety. This person must have gone to school uh, if that person speaks uh, or can speak that variety also. But this other type of prestige is covert prestige. And that's the prestige that non-standard varieties uh, very often have within the speakers of that group. Then attitudes kick in from people who are outside of that group, and they tend to look down upon it so that it doesn't have prestige. But uh, covert prestige, for instance, uh, is, um, is just, just to give a, a clear example, would be uh, inner city youth of uh, black young men who belong to some kind of a very dense network. So this is just one example. And their language within that group has a lot of prestige among that group. So you know, you, you've got to be speaking in a certain kind of a way in order to show that you belong. Your identity is, is this group is, defines your identity. We can find the same kind of a same same kind of a situation among hmm, um, why is it easier to find these examples of of male speakers? If you if you think about um, uh, 
working class white car mechanics. If you pause and if you if you if you hear how they may be speaking to each other, um, that variety is often a prestige has covert prestige among that particular group. So you don't sound sissy or uh, or whatever uh, adjective you wanted to. It's a little bit of a macho variety. And uh, can you think of other other groups who speak clearly non-standard uh, varieties often, and um, and which would be forming like a social network which has where that particular variety has uh, covert prestige. Covert prestige meaning that this variety has prestige even though it's not the standard uh, variety. Could you think of anything else? Beyond my quick examples of two uh, groups of men. I Yes. What was that group? Like gamers, like people who like play games all the time. Yes. They use different vocabulary and certain phrases when they play with each other. Yes. Like, like, yeah, you wouldn't really speak like that in a normal setting. Like you could, but it's still kind of like their thing. Like how their they thing. Play. Their thing, and that is it. So, a, 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 a variety that has covered prestige within a group, it, it is their thing. Um, in back to my old country, uh, in Finland, in the capital city of Helsinki, there is a very strong capital city slang, which is extremely recognizable. They use a lot of words from uh, from uh, Swedish. Uh, Russian-based uh, based, uh, words also, even though they often don't know that this is a Russian-based ba word, uh, some may. But but anyway, it is it's um, it's a highly recognizable slang, which is far away from standard Finnish, the book Finnish, like we sometimes call it, and uh, and it has a lot of prestige among those people. And it has all its covert prestige because it's not a standard variety, and uh, and people who move to the capital city from outside, they also recognize the prestigious slang, and they often start to pick it up to show their identities that okay, I may come from a very rural, far-flung place within Finland, but now I live in the capital city, and I communicate that uh, that partial identity by starting to use that slang starting to uh, to um, kind of adopt it does anything else come to your mind it's kind of like the same in Houston like there's certain mm -hmm. places people from Houston yes would refer to and you can tell when someone's not from Houston because they don't use certain terms or like yeah so there is a Houston slang. Wow. Yes. And see, I am so outside to that particular group <laughs> that, uh, that I haven't really even known that, uh, that there is a... What are the features of it? It's hard <laughs> to think about because it also confuses with like um, urban speech, like A, B, E kind of is mixed with that there are, the majority of the people are of African-American descent. Yes. Hispanic, and a lot of the people who are like of Caucasian descent aren't necessarily from Houston, but they are a few who grew up in that area and start to speak like Okay. So it's kind of hard. That is, that's absolutely fascinating and, uh, and uh, would be a wonderful topic for a presentation. <laughs> So, so study that. What other? I don't think there's been there's been a 
the study done like you know you could write a dissertation once you get your BA first so <laughs> an MA but okay your future is sealed <laughs> so you're gonna be studying Houston's lab up to you <laughs> but anyway those are the kinds of things that you could be looking at how do people reflect you could you could do like a, 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 an interview of people so why why are you using a particular particular way of speaking in a particular situation and very often people say because that's who I am that's me that's the identity that's my identity and I reflect my identity in how I speak and of course this is not like you know because we have multiple identities and we can't like you know really jump from one particular identity to another we carry those identities with us and in the same way we we cannot very often we cannot just jump from from one particular way of speaking to the other one so some of our multiple identities may be reflected in in how we how we speak um, but um, in the case uh, we are starting chapter four, and uh, and in that chapter the term code switching is introduced. What is code switching? It can be different dialects too. Uh, very often code switching refers to people who are multilingual or bilingual, bilingual coming under the category multilingual. Um, and people change from like Spanish to English, back to Spanish, um, in within the same, same speech situation even. Uh, obviously th there is the term diglossia uh, which uh, there is a uh, there are several sub uh, categories about diglossy, and we'll uh, we'll uh, talk a little bit about that. But uh, code switching is when you when you shift either languages, when you change either languages, or or your dialects. Now, code switching is a term that is uh, relatively well established and and. I did my dissertation on Finnish English code switching, so how people, Finnish Americans, change from one language to another. I specifically looked at the, the grammar. Because sometimes we get this, and here we are back to the attitudes. Uh, sometimes people say, like for instance, uh, they, they refer to the mixture of Spanish and English in this country as Spanglish see the air quotes, or Tex-Mex, and those have pejorative connotations, uh, those, those particular terms, uh, easily. Um, in in uh, Canada, because it's a bilingual country where, uh, where both English and French are used, they also have these, these terms that, oh, that person speaks a mixture of French and English. And uh, people sometimes frown upon that, not uh, realizing. And sometimes, you know, even the, the, the people who, who do it themselves, they're like, oh, I shouldn't be mixing two languages. Um, why not if you are in a situation where the others are doing it as well and will understand whichever, uh, whichever code you are drawing uh, uh, drawing, uh, drawing like words from lexical elements. Sometimes we switch, uh, even you know, uh, take some grammatical elements and just you know translate uh, them, and those would be called calcs. That you know you're translating an idiom, which is not an idiom in in the other language. Um, like for instance. Um, in English, we, we use the idiom, I, I'm going to take a shower, right? So in Finnish, we say, I'm going to go into the shower. So I sometimes say in, in English, using English words, I say, I'm going to 
go into the shower, and that sounds sounds odd because that's not part of the part of how we say it in English. Or I can do it uh, vice versa. In Finnish, I say, "Mä men ottaan suihkun." I'm going to take a shower, and that's that sounds odd in you know in Finnish. Uh, if you don't know, if you don't know English, that it's it comes directly. The idiom comes from. Uh, comes from uh, English. So I'm, I'm just telling that because um, we tend to think that in when we mix languages, we uh, take only words from the other variety. But it sometimes can be a structure as well. But uh, code switching uh, has gotten new names recently, as your, as your book mentions. Um, multilingual discourse might be a better term for it because code switching i mean as established as that term is and and people understand it it's 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 used quite widely it has this uh notion that we have two codes and then we mix that and that whole idea or we switch between codes and that kind of you know kind of uh, expresses the ideology that uh, that there are codes that we can choose from um, like intentionally and we can switch codes um, and uh, and there's something uh, something a little bit pejorative um, about the whole notion of switching from one code to another or mixing codes, perhaps code mixing is sometimes also used. But a multilingual discourse covers that whole thing. I am not uh, opposed to the use of the word code switching because it's kind of, you know, it's a kind of good description. We have codes, different varieties of language. And it also covers Di dialect switching, that you use multiple different dialects. And, um, and of course, in when we change a di from one dialect to another, it's not like you're, you're, you're stepping into a different dialect, because sometimes it's just that we, we choose features, more or fewer features, from one particular dialect. So, um, so it's not like really switching, and that's why people have proposed other terms like multilingual discourse, or languaging, or translanguaging. Um, but I don't know how how translanguaging is any better than code switching because it also involves the idea of moving from one to another. But uh, but it's it's. It, these, these things, the changes in the terminology comes up. I was thinking about this yesterday. I just submitted a, a, an article where I was using the term code switching. I'm thinking, oh, should I change this to something else? And, and I try to use different terms, but it's, it's so well established that I think I left a couple of, couple of instances of code switching the term there. Anyway. So, um, so let's, is this, do, do you have experiences of, uh, of people who do code switching multilingual discourse? When my mom talks to me, she speaks Spanish to me, but because she assumes that I don't understand it thoroughly, she switches into English and then back to Spanish, and it's kind of like back and forth English and Spanish, and I reply in English and she'll speak back in Spanish, and it's kind of a whole mess, and it's something that she would tell me, like, oh, we shouldn't do that. You should thoroughly speak Spanish to me or thoroughly speak English to me. But she does it, and it kind of makes me keep doing it back and forth. Well, you can tell her that that's the natural thing to do, because you do have two identities. Your mom has two identities, at least two very strong, clear identities. And English and, and Spanish are reflections of it, and it's it makes makes life in a sense richer that you do have two different two different uh, codes to draw from in order to communicate with you know her precious daughter right and pass these codes on 
do her and um, and then you know encourage you to uh, to continue with the use of both both English in this country is never an endangered code but uh, if, if we expand it's really easy to see how people switch from one totally different language to another one but because languages are not like necessarily these different entities they sometimes people who have worked on multilingual discourse on code switching they point out that um, that uh, in in situations where language two languages are closely related like for instance German and Dutch or even Dutch and English or English and German it's difficult to see if, if there are shared vocabulary items in those two languages it's difficult to kind of like see okay where where did this switch happen because one particular vocabulary item could belong to both languages and if we think of the history of the English language uh, there was a lot of code switching going on in, in its history back to the, the days when English kind of began uh, when, the, when the Germanic tribes came from continental Europe uh, to, um, to England they brought their varieties with them it was the English, I mean the Angles which, from which we get the term English Angles and Saxons and Jutes and Frisians, they brought their varieties to England and out of their varieties, which we don't know whether they were, uh, wish, we would wish to call them separate languages or dialects, but they were to an extent mutually understandable, but they were clearly different, so we don't know. But from those uh, varieties, English kind of like molded, it kind of like merged and uh, obviously English has very many different dialects and they reflected the, the original varieties of the uh, immigrants um, who kind of took over <laughs> England. Celtic languages were spoken there before. But then came the Norman conquest and then we do have a lot of, um, a lot of uh, evidence of the mixing of French and English. There are documents where both French and English are mixed. Also, at that point, Latin was uh, the high variety. We'll talk about diglossia in, in probably next time. But anyway, English was the high variety. I mean, Latin was the high variety. And, uh, and there are a lot of um, documents with, which are written in Latin, but then there is English mixing there, so it was a multilingual thing. Um, I've been working on this multilingual ser sermon collection of uh, uh, 15th, uh, 15th uh, century um, sermons, bilingual sermons, which are mostly bilingual. Latin is the base language there, so it's, um, and, and then there, almost in every sentence in some sermons, you have some English, or at least in every paragraph. And then it's kind of like just, okay, this is a multilingual society, and today we are, today we are like amazed that people are mixing English and Spanish. Well, people always, when languages come into contact with each other, people start mixing them and drawing from both resources. Uh, mixing sounds negative, but it's it is not because you know you, you have you have a larger set of resources to draw from. But uh, as I said, it's easier to notice when a person switches from one language to another. But we all do uh, switching even within English because we sometimes um, switch into a less uh, formal expression within within like a formal situation and uh, or, or somebody draws from a dialect that would be their native dialect sometimes throws in something something that is in a different not it not in the standard English dialect 
would, do you have examples of that happening within basically a monolingual person who is able to draw from dia different dialects in order to do style shifting, that type of code switching? That's great. That's 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 fantastic, uh, because you know uh, it's it's a it's a relatively clearly identifiable dialect, right? And then it's easy to see. Okay, this person is switching now into a different different dialect. But the, you know the same thing would go with with any non-standard dialect, like you know rural, working class, um, or a regional dialect, like a person from New York living here in the South may be using, you know, because people tend to tend to kind of like adapt to the linguistic environment that they live in if that takes a long time, but they might still in certain situations draw from another dialect of English. So monolingual Monolingual code switching, but it's it's style shifting, dialect shifting, used to signal you know different things, um, ideas for papers, if if you're thinking about that or presentations. I did want to um, show you. You read. Uh, we'll talk more about diglossia next time. Uh, because it's an it's an interesting interesting concept that uh, is is not exemplified in its purest form in many situations, but it kind of clarifies this whole idea of how a situation defines what we are expected to what language variety we are expected to to um, use. But uh, in your book. Um, Wardha and uh, Fuller, they refer uh, to the work of Dennis Preston, who was interested in, uh, is a sociolinguist, and, uh, and he, is, he is interested in people's um, attitudes to different dialects, different ways of speaking. And we all have attitudes. Uh, and, and lay people's attitudes are sometimes quite appalling. And we will um, probably next week or within the next couple of weeks also watch a longer uh, video which uh, reflects these attitudes quite a bit. But uh, here is uh, Dennis Preston in a train, in an Amtrak train. And he's doing his research. Uh, this uh, video is from 2008, but uh, his, his research has now been, been published. And um, it's interesting. He, he had maps, empty maps of the United States. And he was basically asking, giving that empty map to the, to the people, and he was basically asking, um, now what do, you, what, what do you think uh, of the different kinds of different ways that people use uh, when when they are you know speaking to, when they come from different parts of the of the states 
and people were then drawing like, okay, here, here these people have a weird dialect, or in this area they don't enunciate some words correctly or whatever, and people were uh, kind of like expressing these value judgments about how other people speak. And, and the interesting thing that uh, is the common denominator of us as humans is that we tend to think that the way I do things is the right way of doing things and everybody else is wrong. So everybody else's variety, is there something wrong about it? But, uh, but very often the people that he, he speaks with in, in this train <laughs> and when he's collecting his data, uh, they uh, express uh, very sophisticated notions of, uh, of what they believe, um, you know, attitudes are about different var varieties. This is uh, sometimes referred to as uh, folk linguistics, that people, uh, people uh, who are, you know, folk, uh, they, um, they, uh, have these ideas, very strong ideas, very often about uh, very often these um, different attitudes. So we have folk linguistics or folk dialectology. Or um, perceptual dialectology. Dialectology, of course, is the study of dialects, uh, but perceptual dialect, dial, dialectology is based on perceptions. This is my perception of this dialect. And these, uh, all, ter all these terms, they kind of refer to the same thing, uh, the fact that people have attitudes. So let's get this going. For this leg of the journey, we're joined by linguist Dennis Preston. Dennis studies the strong opinions we seem to hold about what we believe is right or wrong in the speech of our fellow Americans. But there's a kind of American linguistic insecurity which is very, very old. After all, we didn't invent English. There, there were the English who had a hold of it before us. And so there's a kind of lingering American insecurity that, well, maybe with English we, we don't do the very best thing. On the other hand, there's American populism and a desire not to be stuffy, not to be too correct. I've been walking around this train asking people to draw on blank maps of the United States the areas where they think people speak differently. You want to write anything on it? You know, you can. What they sound like. They don't, they don't just do dialect areas. They identify those areas where they think the least correct or the most correct English is spoken and draw circles around that. Nine times out of ten, when you ask people to do this, they go for either the U.S. South, which is almost universally believed to be a place where bad English is spoken, or New York City. But New Yorkers, you're sure, they don't sound yeah. like Pennsylvanians. Huh? They say what? They say what? Water. 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 Instead of what you said. Water. Water. Well, that's what I say. Americans are ambivalent about language. They may think that New York and Southern accents are bad English, but they can also find them charming. I like hearing people from uh, the South. Really? Yeah. How come? I just, I just like the way they talk, like they hear the way they talk. Let's take race out of the equation. Sorry, okay. okay well, if we take race out of the equation, if I go to a place in the South where at least they are not overtly uh, racist or whatever, I would tend to feel comfortable around Southerners. It makes you come, feel... Come on in here, honey. That kind of, <laughs> that, 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 that makes me feel a little more uh, 
Uh, but I mean, that's some places in the South for me as, as a black man, I'm going to be caught dead. Oh, no, that's another story. Yeah. 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 Make no difference how they sound. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> In a country full of linguistic variety, there's one variety that everyone sees as the norm. There's a great deal of agreement in a sort of Ohio, Michigan, northern Indiana, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania zone of uh, normal English. Even southerners, for example, will reach right up and draw that Midwestern area and say it's normal. So, so this, is, this is where you say the kind of correct American English is spoken. Without an accent, what states are Kansas, Missouri. Kansas, Missouri, Iowa, Nebraska. If you took a speech class, I think that they would want to speak more like these people here. Just Wisconsin, Michigan, Wisconsin, Michigan. Uh, I should add Ohio. That's in there. Okay, Ohio. Ohio. So, that, so if you were, were studying to be a, an announcer or something, do you think this is the... This is what they would... This that's is, the target. This, that's the target. Uh -huh. Technically, the dialect area they're talking about is called Midland. Midland is spoken in much of the Midwest. For most Americans, this is the yardstick, the most normal and correct of all dialects. Stop doing cardio. This sounds backwards, right? Well, believe it or not, it's actually true. Stop spending... That is a pretty strong attitude, isn't it? Yeah. Yes. It's <laughs> pretty frustrating because it's the first yeah. person I met that wasn't a southerner have something to say about southerners. So <laughs> right, yes. <laughs> and how do you feel about his dialect area? That was interesting because when they were speaking about, you know, the Midland kind of yes. thing, I also noticed that, you know, he speaks very differently, more clearer, you know? And because I'm used to, like, people from Texas, people from Louisiana, people from like Arkansas, like, I'm like, okay, I understand exactly what you're seeing, and I don't see any issue, but I think that's the difference, because sometimes I don't understand people from Texas, especially East Texas, I don't understand them sometimes, or people from Louisiana, I have a hard time understanding them, depending on where, and I have family in Arkansas, I don't know what they're saying sometimes, because their accents are so thick, so yes. when I really think about it, like, like the midnight kind of are more. Yeah. I don't, I don't want to call it. I don't want to say plain, <laughs> but it's kind of like you know clear, more clear. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Um, what do you? What kinds of attitudes have you confronted about different parts of the? I don't have very much experience with anyone like further up north, but I do kind of think that that's like the general consensus. Like a lot of people that people from the south are. Um, they come off a little more uneducated when we speak because we're slow. I've, I've heard that at least. Yeah. That um, that we talk slower and would be more twain, but it's also more inviting. Yeah. So. Also more 
Yes, yep. friendly, mm-hmm. friendly and and slow, <laughs> right? right, right. So, and both are of course attitudes. They are value judgments, and it's just a dialogue. Did you all grow up here? And where did you come from? Uh, for the first ten years of my life, I lived in Massachusetts. In where? Massachusetts. Okay. All right. Yes. So, what kinds of attitudes have you run into? Yeah, we, we tend to find other varieties kind of funny. And funny is better than repulsive or, <laughs> or, or so on. But, uh, but it's, it, it is interesting. We, we can't help the attitudes. And, and uh, of course, attitudes, it's, it's part of a natural, natural, it's a natural human thing to have. Uh, and I think I think the the attitudes that we saw in this uh, were kind of like very veiled. These people knew that they were being the observers. Paradox: they they were being filmed, and they had given consent to to uh, be on this film. So I think they were a little bit uh, careful. But anyway, um, think about these things, and then next time uh, we have our first uh, first. Uh, observation or exploration due, and that's the one on page 90, exploration point 4.1, exploration 4.1, everyday multilingualism. I do want to say to to you all, this doesn't necessarily, when you reply to this, if you don't have observations, if you can't make explorations about multilingualism, meaning different languages, uh, this also covers multi-dialectalism. Uh, you all know people who shift from perhaps from one dialect to another or uh, draw from the resources of more than just one dialect. So you can write about that. And it's a short uh, response only, what did I say, 250 words or something like that. Uh, so, uh, so we'll discuss those. Be prepared to talk about that your your explorations in class, what you chose to write about, and what you what you discovered. And then by midnight, you would be turning that in electronically to my email. Okay, and have a good weekend. Um, we turn it in through email, like most of the, like I know you turn in stuff. Through that what we're going to do, or is it going to be on Blackboard? Like, um, send it as an email, uh, because it's not the, the assignment. Is the assignment on Blackboard? No, it's not. It's in the book. The assignment is in the book. So you don't have to go through Blackboard in order to turn this in. You can just send it to my email, if that's, you know. Simpler. It's a, it's a little bit simpler for me if they all come to the same place. Okay. Alrighty.